Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, owner and founder of GC Realty. Mark, besides making me laugh there right before we're about to start, what else are you up to? Oh, I am actually uh, working with uh, a buyer right now, a past guest uh, on here, and I'm helping. I'm representing him as a buyer's agent, which I don't do too often. Um, but I had the unique opportunity to work with a selling agent that I know, so kind of. I kind of was the right fit for the moment, but in doing our negotiation back and forth, there's something that I haven't, uh, you, we haven't talked about it here and I haven't used this, uh, since, you know, before the, the, the recession, uh, last 15 years ago or whatever it is the whole wave waiver of appraisal, which is kind of similar to the, as is, uh, uh, as is negotiating tool people use, but the, the waiver of the appraisal is basically, I don't know if time you've ever done this. It's, Mm-hmm. Hey, we're basically, if it doesn't appraise, I can't use that as a reason to get out and get my earnest money back. I have to, I'm saying that I'm okay. I'll bring the difference to the table, even if, or whatever the bank makes me do. Have you done those? Yeah. So let's I almost, I'm trying to think like tangible numbers we can use, but like, let's say you're getting a loan for 80% down appraisal comes in lower. You were just now making up that difference. So if you, if you did have to bring call it, you know, originally you're going to bring 75 grand to the table or whatever it was, you might have to bring. 95, 100, 200, right? If, whatever the bank's going to lend you up to whatever on the appraisal, and then you would be responsible for the difference or eat your earnest money. Yeah. Now, I was comfortable in doing this because it, it, in this deal, it's a, it's a five unit deal, about a million dollar loan. And what I was able to do is literally get the lender on the phone who's got the appraiser who we end up assigning to this deal to look at the deal before we signed off on that last night. So having your network in place, having your team in place, we're all people that work together. You know, this comes up here all the time, making sure that your team is, is working with you. So that is, uh, that's something that came in handy, just having the right team working with us tonight, last night. Agreed. I, and one other comment too, just, you know, the risk of losing earnest money. When you, when you start scaling and doing more, it, it gets to a point where it's like, it's just the cost of doing business, right? Like one out of 20 times, like something will go wrong. Whereas if it's the only shot you have, maybe you're a little bit more conservative. Exactly. Exactly. So what do we got for the uh, housing provider tip of the week here? I, I think right now in the economy we're in and, you know, the, you know, concerns about, about, uh, you know, recession, downturn, all that stuff. I think when you're underwriting applicants, I think making sure that you're using the whole debt to income ratio is, is more important than ever. Think about it this way. Credit card companies, banking institutions, they're worried, really worried about Americans having too much debt right now. And that means that us as, uh, as underwriting people that want to live in our house and we're expecting to pay us right now, we, we should definitely be paying attention to it. So make sure, you know, debt to income, you know, it's basically pulling from the credit report, their estimated expenses on a monthly basis and making sure that, you know, taking that dollar amount, you know, let's say they have a $2,000 uh, you know, car payment and a $500, you know, debt consolidation. $2,000 car payment. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, $1,000 car payment. Uh, I, I've seen that. Um, but you have all these different things. You add that up and you add that on top of what their income is and look at how that compares to, uh, um, you know, what, you, what you're asking. So if, if people have all these outstanding things, a lot of times they're going to pay that before they're going to pay rent because they're going to have a bigger, uh, bigger, uh, you know, penalty for for not paying that car payment or a bigger penalty for not, um, you know, paying something that's already in arrears or something like that. So take that into account. And one other thing I want to say to that that I heard this on a, another podcast this week too is when you're taking that into consideration, then you got to put their whole cost of living in. And the crazy thing that I never really thought about this way, but think about this: a five dollar or a gallon of milk costs five dollars for a guy that's making two thousand a month. Or making two hundred thousand a year, uh, like that. That the, the, what it costs to live or, or, or feed yourself a lot of time costs the same amount of money. It's kind of a crazy concept that we don't, you know, a, a gallon of milk is a lot more to the guy renting a nine hundred dollar apartment than it is a, a three thousand dollar month apartment. Yep, good stuff. So, all right, excited about our guest today. Another uh, fellow property manager. We've had a few property managers on here lately. So um, I, I know I could always carry these questions uh, no matter what. Uh, so I feel confident coming into them. But today's guest, he has an excessive background, extensive background in selling and leasing apartment properties. He started High Fidelity Property Management in 2010. He's a Chicago native and longtime Northside resident. He utilized his network of contacts to successfully build the business. Uh, he's been growing this management portfolio, which now includes more than 1,000 units in over 100 buildings. Uh, he has a, a load of experience throughout the n- neighborhoods on the north side and the surrounding suburbs. Uh, he's been using his experience and market knowledge 
uh, to continue to grow his property, identify investment properties for his clients, which he's using to be able to help grow his management sides of things. Prior to entering real estate, he served in the United States Navy as operations specialist, and he participated in Operation Noble Eagle following the September 11th attacks and also served as Combat Information Center Watch Supervisor aboard the USS Valley Forge during Operation Iraq Freedom. So uh, he makes the effort and live each day embracing his personal philosophy, which is strive to be a leader, never stop learning, and always try to think outside the box. So without further ado, let's bring in John McGowan from High Fidelity Realty. John, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for asking. Do we leave anything out of that very long bio? I probably should have trimmed it down yeah. for our listeners. Yeah, well, you had a lot of good well. things to talk about. John, um, real, real quick question I want to interject with. Uh, what instrument do you play in your band? Uh, drums. Oh, we got a drummer here. And what for our listeners out there, what type of music, what type of music would you compare yourself to? I know it's a tough question, but uh hardcore punk and metal. Really? Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. It's always uh we only know each other a short time, but you seem more reserved. And, and that's I love when you when someone breaks out like hardcore and, and, and all that. So that, that's awesome, man. I can I can see it. I like to I like to hit them hard. There you go. <laughs> Well, well, talk to us. Um, you know, one thing I always like to um, ask is, I think one thing that goes underappreciated in all our listeners' lives is experiences they have from other parts of their their career, you know, their their growth, where they grew up from, and, and incorporating into real estate investing. How you have extensive military uh, experience, so just thank you very much for that. That's awesome. How did being in the military and, and your experiences there help what you do today when running a business uh, around people and property management and, and real estate? That's a good question. I, I think uh, succinctly um, the values that they instill in you in the military, uh, at least for me in the Navy, it was honor, courage, and commitment. Um, so sort of using those as a guiding principle on how to uh, run your business, which includes managing your, your employees, managing your clients, managing vendors, managing tenants. Um, if you can approach that uh, with honor, courage, and commitment um, at the forefront of your mind while you're doing things, it, it, it makes life um, easier than if you don't. It's awesome. Um, you know, going into, you know, owning your own business, like what, it, w of those, those, those great attributes, like w what do you think is most important in dealing with a, a tenant or, or dealing with the, the daily grind? Honor. Okay. Uh, I, I think honor, being honorable is something that no one can take from you. You know, people can say whatever they want about you online or they can, you know, your, your reputation is everything in this business. And um, if you're not an honorable person, um, that news travels fast. And also like, I'm a big believer in karma. And so like what comes around goes around. And if you, um, strive to do, it's very hard to do the right thing every time, but if you strive to, um, it, it just, uh, it, it makes it easier. Yep. So coming, that's all good stuff, Sean, Com coming out of the Navy, why real estate? Like what, where did you get the bug? Where did you say, you know what, this is my path, what I'm going to do? Or, or was it the initial path coming out of the service? I came out of the military. It was like the, the end scene in Shawshank Redemption, like when he gets through the pipe and he's like, <laughs> you know, like raising his hands. And, like, and I was so happy to be out of the military. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to do something um, in business. I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in finance or, or a trader, uh, real estate, wasn't really something that that even crossed my mind until a good friend of mine from high school, his dad was the business consultant and sales trainer for Chicago Apartment Finders. And uh, he, he said at the time, he said, this is like Chicago's best kept secret. Like, you know, you've got to you've got to get in here at the ground level. Like there's so much for you to learn. I think you'd be really good at it. So I started as a uh, as a listing agent calling cold calling landlords, um, soliciting them for business for Chicago apartment finders. And it was sort of like, um, a, like a, a very fast progression where I learned that, that um, okay, these are non-exclusive listings. These landlords, it's a race, right? Like we're gonna rent them and make the money or they rent them on their own or somebody else rents them and they make money. And I didn't really like that. And I kind of learned that we were subservient to management companies in a lot of ways. 
And so I kind of had the thought right around when the recession came, if I had my own property management company, I could secure these listings and have control over the leasing process and maybe make some money along the way. So that, that's kind of how I got in. And then once, then once I got into property management, I realized that I was subservient to the investor. And so that's when I had the idea to become an investor myself. I'm like, well, if, you know, I just want to be in control. I want to, I want full operational control. I want to be in control of my own destiny. Um, if I am managing buildings and I'm investing in buildings myself, that's my shot at having the most operational control um, and control of my destiny that I can, that I can have. That all makes sense. So let's, let's break it down a little bit for our listeners. You know, we don't, we go with path of listing. We want to then start, you know, managing, where were you managing? Were you just going wherever the business would take you? Or are you specific to certain areas in Chicago or the Burbs? My idea was to start with like, like during the recession, there was this, uh, um, this phenomenon, the shadow market, right? Like there are all these condo single unit condos and HOAs where they weren't sellable. And at the time I was working at Jamison Sotheby's and my goal, really my primary goal was to sell real estate, but I'd go to listing appointments and I'd tell people just for talking sake, um, Hey, I can list this and sell it for you at 300,000. And they'd say, well, but John, I owe 450. And that kind of happened a bunch, you know, like over and over again. And people at that time were relocating outside of Chicago, going where the money was. So like if a job took somebody to Philly or if a job, job took someone to New York or California and they were upside down on their, their condo here, there was this moral dilemma with short selling or uh, going the REO route. So my idea was let me... Let me lease this property for you, if that makes sense. I will incubate it for you and watch over it for you. And when the time is right, I can sell it for you. So I kind of started on the single unit condo uh, route or path, whatever. And um, then I got one large 45 unit building in the West Loop. Um, and I started managing that kind of trial by fire. And through that, it was successful. It was very successful, um, too successful because they, they sold it. And, uh, you know, like it was like a gut punch. Um, my first big project that poured a lot of love and, and uh, care into it. And, but but it, was, it was like after that, I learned that that's, that was my destiny and multifamily was the way to go. So I kind of started setting my sights on multifamily and I never looked backwards from there. Well, let's talk about though, man, if you get a 45 unit to manage and only doing condos, like talk to us about, I'm, it was a success, but just some of those mistakes are though, what the hell do I do here moments? Like give, give a few tangible ones where it was just like, <laughs> oh crap, what is in front of me right now? Sure. Um, we, we started off with a bang. Um, we leased 45 units in four weekends. And uh, with, you know, we had the investors at the, at the open houses. We, I ran it like a military operation. I had, you know, fold up table, bankers bought 45 folders in a banker's box with applications and instructions. And um, we were only taking stuff off the market if we were getting certified funds or cashier's checks, money orders, things like that. Um, and, and that went really well. Well, then six weekends, we moved in all 45 units. And about a week and a half before we moved in our first wave, the 07 tier of the building, there were seven floors on the building. The fifth floor, um, because the building was in receivership and it was older, they had drilled the cabinets into the plumbing risers and the screws, um, they rusted. And after they rusted, they left holes in the plumbing risers. So when we turned the water on that tier, um, it destroyed what, four kitchens and bath, five kitchens and bathrooms. And so we had to go in there and quickly redo uh, five kitchens and bathrooms like in 10 days and we got it done. So that was, that was a challenge. Another, tell yeah, tell me ahead. about the, the feeling though, that, that day you got that news, Is that phone call, did you see it yourself? I mean, that, that you have an entire tier that, that flooded out. Like talk to me about how that felt that day. Like, what, did you feel like giving up? Like I love yeah, this was like, oh, this needs to be fixed. Like, like, let's, let's get it fixed. Like I, I was like, yep, this is a problem. Um, 
but that's my job. My job is to handle the problems. Uh, we, we knew this wasn't going to be a cakewalk and that there were going to be things that popped up. We were working with Focus Construction. They were the receiver on the deal and they were great to work with. They definitely made my job easier, but there was like, you know, it was like, uh, it was more like going into go mode than anything else. It was like, you know, yeah, sure. Like, oh man, this sucks. How am I going to explain this to the tenants? And I was like, well, let's try to avoid that. Let's try, let's try to get it done fast enough, you know, like so that we don't really even have to say sorry or explain away what happened um, and just like get it done and get people in there and uh, go, just, just go forward. I, I love that. I love that. So I think one valuable thing you had there is you went into the 45 uh, unit building and you knew there was going to be some like, landmines um, and, and you're sure. expecting it. And I think when you come across these big problems, I think this is for anybody that buys a property, you just do not know you're going to have a landmine. And if you're just planning that you're going to get jammed with a $2,000 problem at some point during this process or multiple $2,000 problems, or in your case, uh, some crazy hiccups, I think that just makes easier, it makes it so much easier to swallow and react uh, positively. Uh, so I, I love that uh, train of thought that I try to instill in people when I talk to them about the landmines. Well, the other thing that was very helpful was there was there was capital available to get it taken care of. And, you know, like it was it was warranted. And so um, like that can cause a lot of hiccups, too. Right. Like when there's like a lack of capital or these are unforeseen things that are not under warranty, um, that creates delays. So there were no delays. It was just like these things are broken. They need to be fixed. John, go get them fixed. And I kind of moved it down the chain. I'm like, guys, we got to get this done show me the path forward on how to get it done. And they, they actually did a really good job doing it. But that, that was another thing that made it easier and quicker was like a good, we had a good team. The ownership group was great. The receiver team was awesome. And the management team, if I say so myself, we were pretty, we were pretty on it. So you had this 45 unit property. Did you start accumulating for the management side, accumulating other properties of similar size? Like talk about the growth path here. Cause a lot of our listeners are like, oh, you got to this point. We just, we just, you know, glaze over like, yeah, then this happened, this happened and here I am. But like, talk a little about like, hey, I had this opportunity. I nailed it. How did we parlay that? You know, I was laser focused on executing. Um, I, I've, I've never really been one. To, I don't like getting out over my skis. I, I tend to stay pretty cautious. Um, I looked at that opportunity as gold. And so I wasn't really focused on getting more business in tandem with, with managing that because I was pretty much running it by myself and I was learning a lot as I was going. And so um, I wasn't really too focused on growing the company further. I was more, I was more focused on learning and executing for the investor. Got it. Now that makes sense. It's a great attitude. So th th what happens next? You mentioned you got into investing, like what, walk us through the path here. And, and also like what areas of Chicago did you, did you start to focus on? Um, I sort of started eating whatever like was put on my plate. I, I you know, after, after that project uh, was sold, um, I was retained as a, as a manager, for, yeah, more like a, a consultant capacity for a few months. Um, once I knew it was selling, I kind of, you know, like, all right, now we got to, we really got to start ramping up here and figure something out to replace this business. Um, as you guys know, in this business, good news travels fast. I did a good job for those guys. And um, they were also uh, like um, very tough um, investors, you know, like they, like, there's just like, people would ask me like, how did you, how did you do that? And I just said, I, I just would do what they tell me to do, you know? And so um, that opportunity came and went. Um, there were a couple of other junior investment groups that were just kind of getting started out that they were in the condo business before they were doing the condo flips pre-recession. Uh, like during the recession, they were doing workouts and trying to figure out their next moves. Um, by the time I came into the picture, a lot of these guys were pivoting to multifamily. And so um, they kind of heard through the grapevine that I'm like a get it done kind of guy and I can, I can execute. So they started sniffing around, asking me questions, you know, like, well, what if we did this and that? Um, we want to buy properties in Westtown, Bucktown, Wicker Park, um, Logan, like, well, not Logan then, but like uh, mainly, mainly these guys were into like Westtown, Bucktown, Wicker Park. 
And they started accumulating assets pretty quickly. And I just kind of gobbled them up and like everything that they were um, acquiring, I would manage. And um, the reason they, they wanted me to manage them is because they would rely on me to underwrite the rents. And they, you know, we would, we would again work as a team. They would say, hey, like, what do we need to do to get the rents to X? And I would say, you need to do Y. And then they would figure out costs on their end and figure out a business plan. And it's sort of like, you know, if you find the dirt for a developer, you're going to sell the, the product at the end. Like, so I kind of went in with that mentality. Like if I give a strong analysis and I can help them get their rental numbers um, or exceed them, there's no doubt I'm going to, I'm going to be their, their manager for life. And so that, that was sort of the modus of operandi. It was like, you know, start really strong on the consulting side and give them unabashed advice on, on where I think the rent should be and what they need to do to get them. And then as a, as like kind of as an add on, like a value add, just because property management, I learned very quickly is very competitive. Um, I would help them oversee the construction just because of the work I did with focus and um, like my eagerness and willingness to learn and uh, kind of just, I like to be on top of things. Like I would help them oversee construction. And I think that took a load off. Um, and again, it was like one junior group of investors, then two junior groups of investors, then three junior groups, then, then one off six flat referral here, a four flat referral there. But then you, you know, 30 unit building in Albany Park um, a 30 unit building in the, the South Loop. I did a 40 unit building in the, the West Loop. Um, so it, it kind of, I started gaining momentum around 2014 is when it really started picking up for me. And a lot of that momentum, you, you said you're a big fan of karma. And, and I think that ties together with the saying, I always say you create your own luck um, when, you, when you do things. And, and I imagine between that 10, 2010 period and 2014, you're adding all this value to all these people that you're surrounding and word was traveling fast. You're adding all this value. And I'm sure you weren't, I'm sure you weren't charging what your value was really worth too. So you're almost in there. Uh, you're probably getting paid something, but not what you deserve. And you're earning uh, much like a lot of investors that have to kind of come in and maybe be uh, work underneath somebody to learn the ropes and all that stuff. So I just want to point that out. Like you probably put in many years of hard work and added value to others before it actually started to show dividends in your actual income. I'm still doing it to this day, you know, I mean, like it, it, it's, uh, it, that never stops. I don't think. Yep. I, value piece. Going back to underwriting rents. So just, I want to pull this out for a second, take a little two minute detour, but for a lot of our listeners, I feel we get this question a lot. How, how should I underwrite this? What if I do, you know, what if I upgrade the kitchen? What if I upgrade the bath? It, what are some tips that you would give to the people out there? Like where should they be focusing? What they should be, what should they be looking at? Um, it's, I, I, in my head, it's pretty simple, but it's a question that comes up almost like, I don't know, maybe weekly for us. So it's kind of like, I'm biased because I am in property management. I'm a property manager by trade. Like my first advice to people would be zip up the building really tight first. So make sure that the envelope of the building is sealed. Um, meaning like your roof, your gutters, your lintels, your parapets, the top pointing, the windows, gutters and downspouts, uh, if you need drain tile in the basement, do the drain tile. Like if you need, uh, like you don't want water or any, like Chicago is such a like volatile city when it comes to the weather. And so many of the problems I see on the management side come from the buildings not being zipped up properly. So my, my advice is always like, before we even get into the rents and what, what's gonna happen there, like a, a, da a damage seal, a water damage ceiling is gonna cost you money to fix it. It can cost you a relationship with the tenant. And like, it's going to cost you time if you have to take care of that during, during a turnover. So like, that's, that's primary, right? Like making all sure, sure that stuff's done. Second to that, you know, the, the vanilla answer is like, you know, kitchens, bathrooms, and flooring, right? Like, so everybody wants a, like a nicer, newer looking kitchen, nicer, newer looking bathrooms. I think people will tolerate, um, you know, chewed up trim, uh, maybe some older electrical, what's behind the walls, residents, that tenants, they don't really care about that. We do, of course, but like, you know, plumbing, water pressure, stuff like that. I don't think people care about that as much. They care more about how things look. Um, so focusing, like what, what we tend to do when we rehab stuff is uh, 
kitchens, bathrooms, flooring, lighting fixtures. And uh, that's kind of like your, that, that's like the, the baseline. I love how you, I love how you put that out there because a lot of people don't uh, the the envelope that that is not like they go put all this money inside or they buy something that had a bunch of kind of cosmetic uh, things on the inside but then all that stuff ends up getting ruined or the relationship gets ruined like you said because the leak from the upstairs goes two floors down and that, that's such a, I just want to make sure that that doesn't go overlooked that's, that's so important to have all that stuff and. The Chicago, like tuck your bricks on your, if you, everyone loves buying these brick buildings, but they don't, they don't always value how much it costs to take care of them. And, and, uh, every year you let a tuck pointing issue go, it only is going to cost more and, and, and cause other issues pretty quick. Well, and it sucks too. Cause like no one wants to spend $30,000 on something that's not going to impact value really. Right. Like yeah. it's, uh, it's tough. It's a tough pill to swallow, but like going into it, you, you have to consider those things. So John, what, Moving away from the management side for a second, personally, did you start investing in some of these same areas? I first started investing in Logan Square, and I the timeline. Started, what roughly yeah, the what timeline? Year? Oh, sure, twenty fifteen. I started, and I was on the LP side, um, which was cool at first. You know, like I, I kind of had that uh, that preconceived notion that you need like a boatload of money to um, invest in real estate. And I really didn't know how all that worked. So I had some of my investor clients who I was building good relationships with. They're like, John, you should get into these deals with us. You should invest with us. And so, you know, $25,000, $50,000 at a time, um, I would invest in a you know building here, building there. My goal was always like two to three buildings a year. Um, and then as time went by, I think, when did I buy my first one on the GP side? I think like 2017 is when I started buying my own, running my own. And, and since then, I've done like 12. Were you bringing uh, additional value to the deal? Were you managing those as part of the partnership? Yeah. Oh, see, that's awesome. I, yeah. I love that. Because you could, you could probably put a little less in and get a little more and be able to add value that way, or at least be able to control your, your LP. <laughs> yeah and you know like the it, it, like I, I, from their perspective they're like you know no one's gonna like treat this building better than somebody who's investing in it you know so and and it, it was like what's good what good, what was good for the goose is good for the gander and it still is those the, i still manage those buildings and um they're doing really well there's a nice big handful of them in logan that we did and then we moved into lakeview and then after a while we just started kind of chasing yield and uh yeah, sorry. sorry. I want to take a step back here. So uh, you, you're you're messing around in in, uh, in Westtown, Wicker, kind of in that uh, that early 2010, 12, 13 era. Like ten years later, like t- tell me about kind of compare. Like a lot of listeners have only been in the game for a handful of years. Like what was it like then versus now? Because our investors today are looking at other neighborhoods and trying to compare what will be the next areas like that that really take off. Well, like Logan Square, I was a little late to the game in Bucktown Wicker Park. I think Bucktown Wicker really kind of took off in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and I kind of, I just wasn't there. I mean, I like I was, you know, I graduated high school in 99. And so um, after, you know, getting into real estate, finding my footing, uh, Logan Square was the spot. And, and I saw it just because I am a musician. Um, and I kind of have, a, I have a lot of friends who play music, a lot of friends who are artists, a lot of friends in the service industry. And, um, I kind of just followed where, where, where they went to live, you know, and I was like, like, those are the cool areas. That's where I want to invest. And it kind of like, I saw Logan Square go from like, you know, leather jackets and Doc Martens to like North Face and Ugg boots, you know, and like, um, that's kind of like the transition. I mean, it's like, it, it was like, um, the apartments were old and not as well kept um, and cheaper. And eventually there, there came a point where these buildings were in such disrepair or, you know, the market was frothy enough for a, an investor who had kind of just been like limping along with a building and like could get a big number for it at the time. They, they would dish it off and we would buy it. We'd do full gut renovations, um, stabilize the building, manage it and uh i will say i mean like from when we started in 2015 to now um not only have the rents grown but the, the building values have appreciated like a lot as, as you can imagine yeah 
when when you're going into something like that and you're gonna gut, let's call it, you know, an eight unit, a twelve unit, a thirty, whatever that is, can you just talk a little about the preparation for that? Right. Because it's easy to go into a two or three unit buildings empty and go go gut. But talk to about the little bit the logistics of you got probably only a few vacant buildings, you got some tenants in there, some are great, some are long time, some are terrible. Talk to the point where you just get to actually starting the rehab. Sure. I think it all starts with a team, like having the right team in place, having the right business plan in place, um, knowing exactly what you want to do and like, and how long it, it, you think it's going to take, no matter what you're doing, I would always overestimate your timeline. Um, but like, I think what you're asking specifically is like, uh, what happens when you have a building full of people who either don't want to go um, or are afraid. A lot of people, when you buy a building, they're really nervous that something bad is going to happen to them or that like their life is going to change and, and, and you know, you're going to impact their lives in like an adverse way. And so like um, my thing was always like adding the personal touch, going to the building myself, introducing myself to the people who live there, talking to them. If they invite me into their apartment, I go into their apartment. I sit down on their couch. I look at them in the eye. I tell them exactly what our plan is. I try to be as transparent as possible. And um, I also try to create an incentive for them. Um, you know, and like, that's something that you need to build in with your team as you're underwriting these deals. Like, like what incentives do we need to give to the tenants to make sure that we're not like ruffling feathers and like pissing people off basically? Like what, what, what can we do to sort of soften the blow that these people were going to upend their life and they're, they're going to have to move. And, uh, that's a big hassle. So we would do things like, you know, rent forgiveness or, um, you know, just straight up give them money or cash for keys or help them. A lot of people are either too lazy or just don't have the time to, to move on their own. So we would offer them assistance, not just money, but like here are companies or people who can help you. Um, if they were looking for another apartment and they needed another place, making sure that they were connected with somebody who could help them find another place. So we would just try to make life on those people as easy as we could um, so that that would make our life easier in the long run. And we had, we had a lot of success doing that. I think uh, people in that scenario right now are having a tougher time because rents have gone up. So someone that was paying seven or 800 and, and you're trying to turn it into a 12 or 1400, like those people uh, are struggling to even get anything for 900. That's halfway decent. So I, I think that's one of the things I continue to hear people uh, um, uh, run across, which all the more to your point, make sure you build in some sort of budget or, or um, slush fund to be able to not piss people off. We've done well, you know, there were a couple of times where uh, I can think of two uh, specifically. Um, I bought a building in Pilsen, uh, 2235 Colorton, and there was a tenant in there, Caitlin. And um, again, I, I went over there and knocked on the door. I said, hey, I'm the new owner. You know, I, I said, it's just nice to meet you. If you need anything, you let me know. Here's my direct information. Um, just so you know, our plan for the building is, for, you know, it's in disrepair. We're going to have to do a lot of work to it. Unfortunately, it's work that we need to do that we can't do while you're living here. So if there's maybe a way I can get you from this unit to another unit, I have other product that maybe you might be interested in. And I actually moved a couple of people from Pilsen to Logan Square and they're still my tenants today. And that was years ago. So it works. That's awesome. Time. That's awesome. Just having that resource available. Uh, right now we have a client that's uh, got a, a house on the South side. He's looking to sell and it's a section eight tenant. Section eight tenants always have a harder time when you want them to leave uh, moving uh, uh, as fast as you want them to move. So we're actually, to, to what you just said, we're trying to put them into another, they're a decent tenant, so a pretty good tenant actually, so we're going to try moving them. We're kind of controlling that exit and being able to make sure the outcome, they know, by us helping them make some, and you helping them shows that you're on their side, you're not just trying to kick them out, you're not just big bad uh, landlord trying to be greedy. And the other thing is like, even before the fair housing ordinance, or fair notice rather, the fair, fair notice ordinance came to be, um, we were already giving people like like way more notice than we were required to. And, and we did that because we just thought like at the, we, we wanted to try and eliminate excuses, right? So like at the end of the day, when it, when it comes to crunch time and we're on our timeline and we've given somebody 120 days, even though we're only required to give 60 at the time, you know, and they're like, they start pushing back a little. It's like, look, man, or, or 
look, person, like we, we, we gave you plenty of notice. You agreed. We're giving you money. We've offered help. Like, come on, like what else can we do for you? And, and really within reason, we'll, we'll try to work with people. If they even need a little bit more time, it's like, okay, you can have more time. But once that dries up, like we're not going to be able to offer you as much incentive if, if you're going to blow the timeline. That, that fair notice was really born out of developers coming in and kicking people out. Um, and for those of you who don't know what that is, um, if someone had, instead of giving the traditional 30 day notice to kick people out, that might be a month to month. You now have to, if they've been there less than three years, you give them 60 day notice. If they've been there more than three years, you have to give them a 120 day notice. Um, so it makes it, uh, we've actually moved to, uh, like actually serving some of that notice for tenants that we're worried that won't leave just to make sure that they can't say they didn't get notice because 120 days is a lot longer to have to repeat than if you just have to give another 30 days. We went as far as hiring, a, like our own special process server that just works for us directly. Um, and that's been very effective. Oh, I love that. I love that. that that's, uh, and that's a great, great idea. I'm going to write that down in-house it. Yeah. yeah. Keep it, in mind, it, this is for renewals too. Just as a side note, this isn't yes. just when you take over a building, this is on your renewals on your, per, on your properties. Now the, these, the same, the fair ordinance still applies to you. That's right. Yes. Yes. The, the renewals as well too. The renewals that, that's, uh, that's also in Cook County now too. There's uh, outside of Chicago, they have that. Um, I believe it's just 60 days, um, but you have to give that to uh, rent. One more thing to that uh, rent increase. This has been like that forever, but in Chicago, if you're going to increase rent, you have to give the 60 day notice as well too. That's correct. Yep. Look at that. The legal corner of this episode. I love it. Yeah. I'm going to say none of us are lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For everyone listening to this. <laughs> Not contact chance or be back we'll figure it out <laughs> so all right so john like obviously it's been this has been a great path you've had here what's next like what does the next three years look like for you are you still bullish on investing in chicago are you looking to blow out the management side like what what does the future hold for you over the next call it two three years slow and steady wins the race um, I am not in a hurry. Um, I'm definitely ambitious. I have growth plans, um, but I want quality growth. I've, I've drank uh, water from the fire hose and it, and it really hurts your lips. So like, I, I'm just trying to, um, I, you know, I, I look for deals. Um, I'm very picky. Uh, management deals. I, I look for management deals. Um, it has to make sense. We have to, you know, like so much, is is uh, predicated on the owner, not the building, and so like my my vision is to make sure that I'm finding owners that I'm in alignment with philosophically and fundamentally, because um, that again it just makes life easier when you're when you're in unison with people that you're working with, and like ultimately they're your clients, you're beholden to them. Uh, but at the end of the day, like if they don't want to do business the way that you want to do business, it, it just, it can keep you up at night. And I, I am finished with that, or at least I'd like to minimize it as much mm -hmm. as I can. Yeah. Setting it the standard, the quality that you want to provide your, your residents, your tenants, um, if a landlord's not going to allow you to do that or get in the way or not want to fix uh, the tuck pointing <laughs> that he overlooked when he bought the building, like that's right. th that, uh, that, that's what you have to uh, screen for when, when trying to take on new buildings. It's hard though. It's hard to screen for that. A lot of times, you know, like uh, you negotiate a management a contract and you talk about the business plan, but then once, you know, in practice, um, you really learn uh, each other's character as, as not, not so much when things are going good, but when they start to go bad. So um, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at, but I'd like to, to answer your question again, like directly, um, we're at, we're at like a little over a thousand units now. We'd like to be around 3000. I don't really have any, uh, vision to be national or regional or, you know, I, I kind of want to just stay in Chicago. I feel like the six to 50 unit niche is, is a good place for me to stay. Um, I definitely like to breathe a little more life into the brokerage side of the business. I think that there's a lot of meat on the bone there, especially as you know, with everything that's going on. Um, I think that stuff will go on sale here eventually. Um, and then of course, always looking for deals. Yeah. Like, like you and everyone listening <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> deal junkies, we can change this to deal junkies, Mark new name, a spinoff. All right. Spin off. <laughs> so Mark, anything else? No, no, that, uh, I'm, I'm ready to wrap it. That's uh, a lot of good information. Let's do this. John, that was good stuff. Mark, take, take us to wrap here. 
All right, John, what's your competitive advantage? How have you been able to be a quality property manager and investor and so many others which they could be? Uh, owners first. Focus on the owner and satisfying the owner and everything else kind of falls into place from there. What is one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Don't mess it up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I would say uh, acquisition price covers a multitude of cents. So make sure that um, you're getting the best possible price um, that you, you possibly can. And uh, that will help out because um, there are going to be landmines later on down the line. So like, you know, I guess, I guess the short answer is uh, try your best not to overpay. Awesome. What do you do for fun? Uh, I like to golf. I like to run. I like to swim, spend time with the fam, um, eat. I love eating, um, you know, uh, listen to music, play music. Uh, I like to do a lot of different stuff. I work out nice. to eat, not eat to work out. That's, that's my... <laughs> what, what's your favorite side note? What's your favorite venue here in Chicago? Uh, that's a good question. I, I really like Lincoln Hall. Um, yep. I, I, there's something about it, like the size of it, the way it looks, the feeling. Um, that's a really, really awesome venue. That was one I, I had not been there I, probably like five, six years ago. I saw the old 97s there. That was the first time I've been there. I was like, wow, this is, I, I'm a big yeah. like metro type guy. And I was like, oh, this is great. This I was going to say metro. I was, um, but like that was more like, like when I was, you know, a little, a little younger, but now I'm a little older. 18. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> so you graduated. 97s though. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, all right. So what is a good book podcast or self-development activity that you would recommend to our listeners? Um, a good book. Um, I like that tools for Titans, uh, by Tim Ferriss. I thought that was a really good one. I like it because it's not really a linear read. You can kind of like jump around. Yep from chapter to chapter. I thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, Self-development, um, I would just say like, get into the practice of meditating. Um, however you need to do that. I think that Headspace app is a great place to start for people. Um, that's all I got. How about the English accent on Headspace? You can meditate to the English accent. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I did it a long time ago, like Headspace. I've been, I've been on my own kinda. I use like the Tibetan monk chants. Um, so I don't really need the guided meditation as much anymore, but I, so I like the meditation, you know, the guided, uh, not guided, the, uh, the, the monks and the bells and the chanting and stuff like that. That seems to get me more in the zone than the British guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. No, um, we've talked about it on here before, actually with, uh, who we talked about someone that has chance. Someone had an accent on here. We're like, oh, I can. Oh, Lawrence too. Dunning with the accent. Oh, it was Lawrence. Yeah, it was Lawrence uh, Dunning. We talked to him about. Um, all right, awesome. Besides yourself, name one person in your local network you'd highly recommend as a quality resource to other investors. Uh, I think Aaron Galvin at Luxury Living is the first person to come to mind. Um, he's he's a great dude and he's extremely smart and very driven and runs a very very tight business. And, uh, I have a lot of respect for him. I think he has a wealth of knowledge. He is. He was on episode. I know you're looking it up, Tom. Well, I wasn't looking it up. I was going to say, I I've been a client of Aaron's. He helps lease up a, a bigger building for me. And we did have him on episode one, something. Yeah, he, he was a great episode. He talked a lot about growing his business. 124. Using, 124, using EOS and, and all that stuff. So that, that was a great episode with him. Yeah, absolutely. And I have so many more I can name. I really do. There's like, you know, right as soon as I said him, there's like five other people that come to mind, but he's, he's the first. Yep. All right, he wins. So, awesome. John, thank you so much. You provide a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Um, you know, send me referrals would be the best thing. Um, uh, my, my email is john, J O H N at high five PM.com. Um, you can find me on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, all those places. And, uh, we're very excited. We're just about to launch our, our brand new website that should be out next week. So, um, once that happens, I'll, I'll shoot you guys an email and make sure that it'll, all the, all the listeners know to go on there and give it a, give it a look. There's a lot of cool resources and information on there as well. And we will make sure to link to all that in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you. Mark, Chicago fact. I see you smiling over there. Who are we playing for? Uh, Shannon Gordo out of Westmont. Um, she bought uh, she bought a t-shirt a couple weeks ago. So it looks like, yeah, a couple weeks ago. All right. It, just a note on those t-shirts. They run a little large. 
You can okay. shrink them, but they they run about half size large. If you're if you're gonna go in between, just just some advice there. All right. Nice. So Mark and John, you'll get a shot at this too. Multiple choice. Which Chicago mayor won with the highest margin of victory in any Chicago mayoral election? And again, not the primary, the overall mayoral election. Was it? Yeah, I gotta I gotta go with Daly Senior. Hold on, hold on. You get multiple choice. Oh, it's multiple choice. So you get either William B. Ogden, Jane Byrne, Richard Daly, or Rahm Emanuel. Daly's my answer. Maybe Rahm on the first one. I know it wasn't Byrne. I, I would probably say, say Rahm Emanuel on his first term. See, this was kind of a trick question. It was Byrne. Really? What? Really? So, That's surprising. Remember, like she barely she squeezed through the primary. But it's the main election, which the Democrats always win by, you know, 75% or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, okay, maybe I'm, that's what I'm confusing about. All right. Sad. So she, just like some side note here, and Mark, we've actually talked about this, the incumbent mayor, I can't remember his name, but that was the, the blizzard that took him in. Like yes. she, was a, she was a huge underdog. Then the blizzard happened, and then Jesse Jackson endorsed her, and yeah. that's where she had a huge, like, influx of African-American voters. But then he flip flopped to Harold Washington the next year. Yep. So she got crushed. <laughs> yep. But she had her four year run. That's awesome. All right, John. Awesome show. Thanks for coming on, Tom. Thank you as always. Listeners, um, join us. We have the property management best practice group we started, and John actually signed up for it as well, too. So we're meeting next, we meet once a month. Uh, if anyone's interested, we do have information on the straight up Chicago investor.com website. Uh, listeners also want to say thank you. Our ratings have gone up and also our, our, our downloads. So you either Tom's downloading a whole bunch more from all his different devices, or you guys are actually helping and spreading the word. So uh, I'm assuming it's the latter. And I uh, want me and Tom, want to just do a special thanks to everybody. John, thank you again, Tom. Uh, thank you. And listeners, we'll see you next week. It's a pleasure. Thanks all.